are back now with a roundtable. I'm joined by Matthew Dowd again. Welcome back. Ruth Marcus of The Washington Post, David Sanger of The New York Times, Joe Klein of Time Magazine, Peggy Noon of The Wall Street Journal. We're covering the waterfront <laughs> today, at least of the Northeast. Uh, let me begin, Matthew, talking about the fiscal cliff. We just heard from the two senators right there, and I wonder if those two senators might be a bit of an anomaly. You have uh, Dick Durbin for the Democrats ready to take on entitlements, Lindsey Graham for the Republicans ready to take on revenues. Well, I think the president was put in a great position in the aftermath of the election to get a deal done. And I think most people in Washington want to get a deal done. Those people making arguments that passing the past the fiscal clip going over might be a better way. I think that for the markets, for all of the other reasons, that I think getting a deal done is much better. I think it'll be a short-term deal. It'll be a short-term fix. It'll be a fix on some revenue, some expenditures. It won't go much past two years. They won't do anything on entitlements. They don't really make any fundamental changes in those programs. It'll be a short-term deal to get done. But there is oh, a growing sense. That's a deal, but that's something. <laughs> there, is, there is a growing sense, though, from both sides. It seems to be going over the cliff is not a bad thing. Well, there's some of that, and you heard that from Grover Norquist, also from Senator Patty Murray for the Democrats. But Ruth Marcus, you've been uh, covering budget battles, I think, going back to 1991. <laughs> no, don't age we were, me. I, I was there too. It's okay. <laughs> All right, don't age us. <laughs> but you're actually picking up, and you're reporting a little more pessimism about the possibility of a deal. Yeah, I've, I've been going before the fiscal cliff, up and down the fiscal roller coaster, because, as you know, George, from the previous battles, it always looks like it's not going to get done just before it actually gets done. That said, I've been very disappointed, and I agree with everything that Matt said about why it's important to get it done and what's doable. But the Republican House offer that came in the aftermath of that very nice sounding meeting with words of encouragement and moderation and flexibility on both sides, it was an offer, as far as I have reported, that did not reflect the impact of the election no increase in rates, no specified, uh, increase in revenue, but nothing specified, get rid of the sequester, no trigger if the, if the tax reform doesn't so no produce anything. Mechanism. And also pay attention to this, no increase in the debt ceiling. And the president has been very clear, and the White House, he does not want to have to go through that again in February if we sort of solve the cliff in January. All of that adds up to a pretty dire situation. That's true, Peggy Noonan, but it does seem that both the president and Speaker Boehner know that in many ways their legacy is on the line and they have to get something done. They must have it on their mind, the two of them, that if they really wanted to, worked hard, were very shrewd, they might be able to sort of replicate that great old memory that all of us have of uh, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill being able to make some big agreements, even though they had such disagreements and their party conferences were opposed to each other. That was one of the last times Americans looked at, at Washington and thought, oh my goodness, this place works. I think the president and the speaker could see this as an opportunity, this fiscal cliff thing, to convince people, you know what, we still can govern. And that would be heartening. You agree? Uh, yeah, I mean, I may be getting old and soft-headed uh, and, and too weak to be cynical, but I, I, I actually am... You're not am, getting old. I, I'm actually... <laughs> <laughs> from your lips to God's ears. And this is my but, <laughs> but I, I think that, that this election mattered in a way. Um, I think that there was a tremendous fever in the country, uh, a fever of intransigence and partisanship, and that fever has broken. I think Grover Norquist's sell, sell by date has passed. And um, Obama has already put entitlement reforms on the table in his private negotiations with, Gro with, uh, with Boehner uh, a year ago. And, uh, and I think that we're going to get a deal. We may go over the cliff for a week or two weeks or whatever, but I, I, I'm optimistic that there's going to be a deal. And, and there's some talk that actually going over the cliff wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, because at least for Republicans, then everyone's taxes would have gone up without a vote for them, and they're just voting to cut taxes. Well, that's right, but also the president's leverage goes up as you get closer to that date, George, because exactly because the, the taxes all go up, at that moment, then he's just negotiating about how much to cut them back down. And I suspect that as they get closer to the date, the Republicans are going to look at the president's leverage post-January 1 and think they n may not want to go face that. There's a second element, though, that uh, comes into this, which is that once you're past that date, 
it's very bad for the markets, as, as Matt said, but it may not be an immediate effect on the economy. Yes, there are cuts that go into effect on the Pentagon. It's about a 7 or 8 percent cut on everything. Everybody will look at this and say, this is probably the worst way to cut the Pentagon budget. As one Pentagon official said to me at one point, what do we do, call up Northrop Grumman and say, we don't want the last 7% of that airplane, keep the tail? <laughs> but, but, but as David points out, the, what happens on January 1st is more of a slope than a it, cliff, even well, though it could the, create a recession over the long term. The cliff is a little bit of a misnomer, um, because, but we, it could be a cliff in the sense that markets can react very badly. We have really lucked out in the sense that despite our apparent inability to govern ourselves and come to the compromises that everybody wants, that we haven't been punished too much by the markets so far. Uh, so far. But one of the things that's interesting is you have the extremes in both parties willing to go over the cliff. At the same time, you asked Matt if uh, Senator Durbin and Graham were an anomaly. I don't think they are in the sense that I think there are a really growing cadre, especially in the Senate, of members from both parties who understand the elements well, of a deal. And that's yes. what I was going to follow up on. If you could, if there's some way you could substitute truth serum into the water in the Capitol and got everybody to ask these same questions, they all know on both sides of the aisle, the administration and everybody in the media knows revenue has to be raised, and the only way is to raise real revenue is to increase the tax rate on the wealthy. That's the only way. Maybe combined Cut, with capping. Cuts, right. cuts have to be done, including defense cuts. Most people have hanging a son who served in the Army. Everybody knows defense can be cut without without hurting our security. They know entitlement reform has to happen. Both sides of the aisle all know that. And they also know Grover Norquist is an impediment to good governing and not. The only thing good thing about Grover Norquist is he was named after a character from Sesame Street. <laughs> and that's, I hope, the last we could Norquist? hear of it. I'm, Grover. Grover. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I think it goes back to Boehner again. I mean, I think that there is a centrist coalition to pass this in the House. You know, you may lose the Tea Party on the right. You may lose some of the more extreme liberals on the left if you do entitlement for reform. But I think you got 250 votes for something in the middle. It depends on whether John Boehner is willing to risk his speakership in order to have a legacy. And, and, I take and it Nancy Pelosi will have a role here, too. One has the sense that the leaders of the parties have fear sequester and fear going over the cliff. They don't want it, even as members in their parties are starting to talk more about sequester as actually a way out, and a way out that puts the other side on the defensive. And, and meanwhile, I know you have all have seen the movie Lincoln and Ruth. You watch it with some members of Congress. Forget about the truce here, Matthew Dow. Maybe, maybe all these members of Congress should go watch the movie before they make, go well, in to make the deal. That's what I wrote, that the president had this screening of Lincoln at the White House, which I was not at. But he should have a, a regular 4 o'clock showing. Everybody should come, sit really down in those nice happen. seats eat the popcorn and recognize a few things from the president's point of view that it, that nice words and lofty speeches gettysburg address are wonderful but we also need sort of hard-headed a little bit sl sleazy deal making lobbying we'll call it it's to go along with movies with the no it's wonderful it, 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 to go it along is. with it and also from the point of view of congress that Congress can rise above itself, can rise above partisanship and parties. Oh, uh, but also, I think that the ultimate message of that wonderful movie, I thought it was an act of patriotism on Spielberg's part to make it in that way. The ultimate message is bring back earmarks. So that, <laughs> so that you buy off so, the you know, of right, course, of Earmarks have always been the grease you know, that greases the wheels to get things, get things done. I think John McCain did a tremendous disservice to this country by making such a huge campaign about earmarks when there are far bigger and more important tar targets to be met and, on And I think one country. of the great things about that movie, beautiful movie, love the movie, is, is that progress is never made through pure means. And that, I mean, if everybody has this vision of Lincoln right. and all that and this whole idea of Lincoln, he was so forthright in that. But basically, he employed impure means in order to accomplish something that was going to make the country progress, the 13th Amendment. And that, I think, is a great lesson. Definition it, of politics. Yes, it is. Let, let me note on this, by the way, I have a feeling the grail on this whole issue is going to be all about spending and entitlement reform as we've been looking at the whole tax uh, debate the past six months. No, it's going to be about spending and entitlement reform. If Republicans see serious movement there, they will be much more likely to be. go here.